My name is Monk Rowe, and we're filming at Hamilton College for the Jazz Archive, and I'm really pleased to have Henry Grimes and Rashid mm -hmm. Ali with me today, two of the most forward-thinking people I've come to know. I think it's safe to say. Hmm. You think of yourself yeah. as a forward-thinking person? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very much. Yeah. Um, I... I I like to see a career where, you know, if you look in the bios about you guys, it will say that you played with this fellow and that fellow and this band and that's and, and now it's come to the point where if you look up people, list that they've played with you. Oh yeah, because yeah, I guess you know, we've been around quite a. You've been around. You know, we've been around the block a few times. Yes. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of that going on now. Right. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask about a few current things uh, before we sort of go back in time a little bit, but uh, Henry, did, did you just do something at the UN I read about? Yes, we just did uh, uh, something that's going to be going on uh, between New York and, and uh, Jerusalem, uh, Jeru yeah, Jerusalem, uh, around uh, part of a few months and a couple of months from now. Uh, and uh, all bases and, uh, you know, uh, Israel and New York. I mean, not Israel, Jerusalem and New York. And How many base players is that? Oh, wow. Well, it's it's, uh, it's, 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 it's some Israeli of, base players, too? Yeah. Uh, yeah, a, couple, a few Israeli and... Uh, There's... Uh, is, 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 uh, 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 I'm, uh, uh, Omar Avadal, is he on that? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Let Omar Avital, uh, he's a great bass player from Israel. Oh. And maybe he is. is. Maybe he is. Is it called Deep Tones for Peace? Yeah, uh, Deep Tones for Peace. Yeah. Have you, you heard of that before? I, I had just, I just read it in your information. It, oh, yeah. It sounds fascinating. That's, yeah, it, it is. I'm, I, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. And Rashid, I know you're you're happy with right now with you've got your own quartet. Is that right? That your quartet, quintet, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, you know, this is I have many quintets since Coltrane's days. Yeah. And uh, this is the one I have now is the most workingest one of of all because you know the other quartets, the quintets, and whatever trios that I had since Coltrane, it was just that I, I, I was never, you know, I'm not really good at hustling gigs on my own. So, um, and I never really had an agent before, maybe since since five years ago now. So I never really got a lot of work, so I really couldn't keep a band together very long without keeping them working. So I went through quite a few bands. But the one I have now, since I've had an agent for the last five to six years, I've been, been together about four years now, and uh, I'm very happy with it. What's a good month for you as far as your band, you know, as, as far as gigs? A good month? Yeah. How many times would you well, play? Well, uh, you know, uh, I would say, I would say the spring and the fall and the summer months. Mm -hmm. The winter months aren't so good. Yeah. The spring and the fall and the summer months are really good, especially in Europe because they have a lot of outdoor festivals there. And even in America, they have a lot of outdoor festivals during the summer and springtime. And uh, so, you know, I think uh, most of us good. Spring, fall, summer is the best times. Okay. Mm. Let me ask you about uh, growing up in uh, Philadelphia. Henry, I think I heard that you, your parents were musicians. Yes. Uh, as, as much as I know about it, it's mainly uh, hearsay. Really? But uh, the closest I came to, ever came to music in the house uh, when, uh, when I realized that we had a piano in there. And, uh, so I used to try to play it, and, uh, but nobody else. Um, my brother, maybe, no, I don't think he, he did too much, though, but I did uh, and for, a little, for a little bit. and. I never found out if they are really musicians or not. You don't. You don't know why they sort of got out of the business. No, I don't. But I know it seemed like a very. 
they, like they must have known some uh, professional bearing uh, mm -hmm. years before they, you know, uh, you know uh, became uh, popular. I mean, not popular, but gave it over to uh, musical. Uh, I see. Professional, professional life. What was the radio part of? Uh, Learning music at the, in those days for you guys. The radio. The radio. I mean, did you listen to music? I used to listen to a lot of uh, a lot of music from uh, Dixieland to uh, up to about uh, uh, '53. You know, when you hear uh, Charlie Parker and Miles Davis mm -hmm. and those kind of groups. You know, uh, but be in between there. Uh, I used to listen to um, the Dorsey Brothers, you know, like, uh, and uh, you know all of those associated players like yeah. uh, Gene Cooper and uh, mm -hmm. I one wanted to fans. play with some of them, but I never, did, I never did play with right. them. Were you a but Gene Cooper fan? Oh yeah, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I was yeah. definitely one. Uh, yeah. Music was in my family. My whole family is very musical and. Uh, so my whole life, I remember listening to Billy Holiday when I was a, almost a toddler. So, I mean, like Charlie Parker, my father bought all those records, mm. all those 78s records and stuff from dial labels and stuff. So like music, I, was, I came up in music. My mother was a singer and my grandmother, she, she was a minister of a church. She had a little holy roly church in a corner church and she had five daughters, my aunts, and they all played piano and they all sang in the choir in church. And, and I had piano lessons before I could almost walk. And uh, it, I mean, and, um, so I listened to music my whole entire life. My uncles played professional music and they used to have sessions in the front room because there was a piano in my house, of course. And it was also a piano in my father's family's house. So it was pianos in both places. I mean, like in my mother's house and in my father's family's house, it was a piano downstairs everywhere. And so I just started playing the piano and my aunt was, my aunt was a professional piano player at the age of around 12 or 13 years old. In fact, she was so good. So Lama Hampton wanted to take her when she was 14 years old, but my grandmother wouldn't have it. She wanted her to finish school and not get involved in music, but she was that good. She won all those talent shows and stuff. And my mother, she sang with Jimmy Lunchford's band at a, at a talent show. And, and, uh, and we had a place in Philadelphia called the Earl Theater. And the Earl Theater was like, it was like a, you know, it was a theater that showed movies and then showed a live show then a movie, then a live show. And I seen people like Sammy Davis Jr. when he was a kid playing with his uncle and his father, oh. and Charlie Parker and J.J. Johnson and everybody, you know, because mm -hmm. we used to go to the Earl Theater all, all the time, you know, like that was a present for my mom. If we did our chores really good, she would give us money to go down to the Earl Theater and sit down there for all day long and watch a movie and then listen to bands. So I was, I was into music m even before I knew what music was. So, I mean, I... In watching those people at the Earl Theater, did you say to yourself, that's what I want to do? Oh, I was in love with, 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 with people like Sarah Vaughan and, and, uh, and, and Billie Holiday. Uh -huh. You know, those, those were some of the most beautiful people I ever saw in my life. I would just sit there and, and look at them and just be completely fascinated by them. And, and, uh, uh, and then I, you know, and my uncle, he played with like Jimmy Heath and John Coltrane and all those guys in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And they used to have sessions in the house, but I didn't really know who they were until I grew up, you know. Right. But uh, he used to tell me that they used to come around, Benny Golson, and he used to come around and they used to play in the living room and sometimes they would put me out because they was doing things they didn't want me to see them doing. Uh -huh. And I would go around the front of the house and I would pull myself up to the front of the window and watch them and see my aunt, she died 
She played piano. She was a very talented piano player, but she died at childbirth. She was only 20 years old when she died. Mm -hmm. And her husband was a drummer. And uh, so, you know, there was drums in my house. And I mean, it was just, I was swamped. I couldn't, I couldn't have been anything else other than what I am. Yeah. It was impossible for yeah. me to be, I never really did anything other than play music anyway, most of my life. Henry, did you get to the Earl Theater at all? Is that something that you would have done? Uh, yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I, I uh, well, I was in North Philly, uh, and I lived in South Philly, so I never uh, got a chance in those places too much. But yeah, I but did. you know where the Earl was, right? Yeah, it was I know right on 11th and Market. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. familiar with it as, uh, you know, as, as uh, just... See, Market North Street North divided North Philly oh. and South Philly. And I lived on the north side of Market Street. Henry lived on the south side, which was, you know, like, you know, like Jimmy Heath and all those guys from there, from down that way. And, uh, and, and uh, Tootie and all those guys. Tucker, that's the drummer Ronald I was trying Tucker, to tell yeah, you. Ronald that's, Tucker. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. that's the drummer I was trying to think about the other day. So he's from down your way, right? Uh, yeah, Ronald, Ronald Tucker. I, I, yeah. I was thinking of another one, uh, another guy. Uh, I think Ronald Tucker was one that had Yeah, Ronald, 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 right, that's right. But this guy that I'm trying to think of it is the same thing. I haven't, I haven't seen okay. him for years. How did you guys make uh, spending money back in those days? I didn't make any. My mom gave me to me. Mm. <laughs> I wasn't making no spending money at all. No. No, I was, you know, my mom and dad was giving me money, you know, mm. until I went to the service. I went to the service right. when I was... I had to put up my age to get into the service because I was getting a little rambunctious and mom wanted me off the street. Mm. So she took me to the army and signed me in. No kidding. Yeah. Was that she had to get me off the street. 52 or something Right, like right, that? right. Yeah. You know, and I stayed there for three years in the service. And when I came out, I had my head a little screwed on a little better because I got into the army and really got into the music thing because that was one way of ducking the real, the regular army stuff, you know, like the digging the ditches and marching yeah. out and doing all that crazy stuff. Yeah. So I had a chance to get into the band, which put me in special service. And all I had to do was just make practice and make reveille and do a couple p parade things and and then play. I would, you know, I would play at night with bands in town, and mm -hmm. it was kind of fun being in the Second Army Band. Was the service integrated at that time? No, I was in the army when it integrated. I was there. You know, I mean, you know, they integrated the whole army in 24 hours. Wow. They just went like, they just went like, you know, like we lived on posts and we lived this part of the post and all the white soldiers lived on that side of the post, right? And we was a black outfit with all white officers, yeah. you no know, black officers, you know. And when I saw a black officer, we was like, wow, there's a black captain. Can you believe this? You know, we was like amazed because we never seen a, a black officer. And uh, one day, you know, the master sergeant marched us all out, marched us all out, and he did the same thing, crossed his tracks with the white guys. And then they called names, right? They called names and they say, okay, you guys fall out over here and you guys fall out over here. Then they just meshed them. Everybody just went together, and then we b went back into our barracks, and we were integrated. Just like that. And how did people feel about it? How did Oh, man, we had it? more fights than you can believe. Oh, <laughs> no oh people would be saying the N-word, and people no. would be saying the C-word, and, and they'd be making mistakes, and, you know, just, you know, you know it, was, it was critical for a while. But it got okay, you know, yeah. it got okay, but it took a while. It took a while for us to adjust to each other, you know, because we would just say things that we were used to saying and go, oh, and next you know, bang, you know, <laughs> it was like, it, it was pretty rough, but it was really cool. I mean, it, it really turned out good. And in the band, we didn't have no problems in the band, you know, because we had a sergeant who didn't take any, any stuff at all. And uh, it, it was really cool. I mean, we, I was there when when they integrated the Army, the United States Army, I was on the scene. That's neat. Yeah, that was something else. Uh -huh. Was there any discrepancy in the, in the pay you got 
between the white and the black soldiers. Everybody got the same, same money. Same money. Everybody had the same benefits. Uh -huh. Everybody had the same everything. It wasn't no thing like that. Yeah. It was just segregated. Yeah. That's all. Right. And uh, and they desegregated the army. Just like in one, I mean, the whole United States Army, they did it like that. I guess they did because we just, I don't know, they did it to us. And yeah. uh, we were in Camp Pickett, Virginia when that happened. Camp and what? Camp Pickett, Virginia. Pickett. I was in 1953, I believe it was. Did you have uh, any uh, thoughts you might be sent over to Korea? Yeah, you know, that was my, that was the only mistake that my mom felt that she had made is to get me in harm's way because she insisted that I go into the service because I was getting pretty stupid in the street, you know. Mm -hmm. I had quit school, I didn't want to go to school, I didn't want to do anything other than hang out in the street, right? And uh, so she put me in the Army, and she really saved my life because I didn't go to Korea. Mm. I went to Europe instead. And it was a blessing, you know. But I had friends that went to Korea, and I had a couple of them get hurt over there and everything. But I went to, I went to Germany, and I spent, the, I spent my last two and a half years in Germany in the service. Mm. So I didn't see anything like that. Uh, and I was in a second army band, so I was, I had, a, I had a real good, I had a real good prosperous and, and a really good time in the army. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about music and a lot about life. Bet you learned how to roll, huh? Yeah, I learned how to play the drums. <laughs> For real, I learned how to play the drums in the army, because I was in the drum corps, of course. Yeah. Henry, you spent some time in a uh, couple music schools, right? Yeah. Uh, 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 well, Massbaum, is that how you yeah, say Mass it? Bomb, Mass yeah, Massbaum, yeah, that was uh, at my pre-college uh, school, and then I went to oh. Juilliard. Massbaum was like a vocational school, right? Oh. Yeah, yeah, vocational technical school. Yeah, vocational okay. technical school. Well, when you went to Juilliard, were you learning what you wanted to learn? When I went to uh, Juilliard, I, di I did, yes, I did. I was doing things... Uh, for instance, for instance, uh, I was uh, well. I played the bass for choral groups, and uh, one day to rehearse uh, with the with this chorus, I would be the only bass player, you know, mm -hmm. playing playing with the with these chorus groups, and that uh, was a very uh, challenging kind of a thing to do, you know. And um, uh, but I also uh, uh, when I I went to uh, Ju oh yeah, when I went to Juilliard, also uh, I, uh, I I played in, in an opera orchestra, and it was only about uh, two or th two or three basses in that, and I played with with that uh, uh, reading, you know, a lot of reading of music, right. some musical scores that way, you know, which I I, very, I, I enjoyed very much, you know, because uh, it was the first thing I ever touched in a real. Uh, Technical sense, you know. I never had that kind of feeling before. Just playing something and uh, and the feeling uh, just j just doesn't go over that way, you know. Mm -hmm. Some some other way you get Must stuck. Must good for it. your bowing chops too. Oh yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good for for everything. Yeah. Yeah. But then you both got into the rhythm and blues scene, and I'm trying to get a sense of the, the guys you played with, uh, Big Maybell and, and so forth, those were current pop artists at the time in those years. Yeah, they were Philadelphia based artists. I mean, most of them, they were all out of Philadelphia. Oh. Uh, Lynn Hope, and uh, he played saxophone. And actually, the train played with Lynn Hope, and, uh, and that was great. I got that gig with him uh, just for a little while. I played with him. Mm -hmm. Dick Hart and the Heartaches, I played with that band. Dick Hart and the Heartaches. Dick Hart and the Heartaches, that's what they call themselves. Yeah. And um, Big Maybell, I played with her for a couple jobs. And uh, I mean, you know, it was, I mean, that was the way to go. I mean, that was actually, I was, I was more or less my learning years, you know, playing with that kind of stuff because, you know, I always wanted to play bebop. That was my main goal. And, uh, but it wasn't that many gigs together, and I wasn't all that really experienced to, to get those gigs yet. So 
I cut my I cut my teeth on on playing with rhythm and blues bands for a while, and you know that was cool too because what I liked about that was that you know Coltrane was always my idol, you know, after after seeing with Miles Davis, and then when I looked back on it, I, I had noticed that he had played with a lot of those bands at first, you know, when he first came through, and he also went to Grand Off. So when I came out the army, I enrolled in Grand Off Music School. Mm -hmm. But that was only for half a semester before I just got out of there. I didn't, I didn't really deal, like dealing with theory and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. I really wanted to play, but I just went there because that was the place where all I thought all the good bad musicians went to, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I, I played a lot of that rhythm and blues stuff for a while. Then, then I just started playing jazz. Mm. Henry, can you remember what some of those rhythm and blues gigs would have paid at the time? Well, I forgot totally what I got, <laughs> what I got paid. Uh, but it was uh, up, very uplifting. I never remember to get paid because uh, that was the most money I ever made in my life, you know. Whatever so, it was, it was yeah, the most you made. Yeah, it was the mo most money I may ever made, you know. And uh, I mean, you know, a lot of it was left over in there, wherever they <laughs> keep it money yet, but uh, I mean, but it was, uh, for instance, uh, a musician like uh, uh, Willis Jackson, if you play with him and it's a, a matter of money, it's, all right, it's pretty cool, you know. I mean, if you never Willis played Jackson. with any, you know, anybody like that, yeah. the pay is cool. That's a good feeling to like yeah. get paid for something that you're loving, right? That you like to do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it always amazed me when I got money for doing that. <laughs> it always did. Yeah. And eventually you both, did, did people tell you, do you have to go to New York, or did you just sort of sense that that was where? Well, I knew that's where it was because I used to go to New York all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just get in the car and drive there or the, catch a bus and go there. And, mm -hmm. and I knew a lot of musicians in, in New York, but... But actually, I had a, one night, John Coltrane was playing at, at this club in Philly called uh, 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 Showboat. It was on Lumber Street, down your way, mm -hmm. uh, 15th and Lumber. And, and I was there, and, and you know, I was, I was pretty, I was pretty, ex I was pretty experienced drummer at that time. And, uh, and uh, and I was bugging him to let me sit in and play with him, although Elvin was kicking down doors and stuff. But I still had enough mm -hmm. heart to ask to sit in, you know. And but he wouldn't let me because you know because he had just started the band. This was in the early '60s when he had just put this band together, you know, with Elvin and McCoy, who was a real good friend of mine because we used to play a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and uh, and Reggie Workman, who was also was a, I mean, he had my real good friends in the band, you know, and that's why I felt like I needed to get this gig, you know, but he had this guy from Detroit who was Elvin Jones, and uh, so I was, you know, I was asking him to let me sit in, and I was being stupid about it, and he was telling me, no, no, you know, uh, I just put this scam band together, he said, but he said, but you know, you should go to New York, man, he said, because it seemed like you kind of burnt Philly up, and uh, and, and you should go there because there's a lot of mus musicians there that's thinking like you are, more or less than here in Philly. And so he sort of told me that, and uh, six months later, I moved to New York, actually. And how were you thinking? He said they were thinking like you were. Yeah, well, we was thinking about trying to play something other than 4-4 four, four time, hmm. trying to, you know, trying to stretch the beat out trying to play a little more open and a little more freer. Mm -hmm. And because that's what they were doing, you know, and that's why I felt like I could sit in and play with them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, he, and he just said like, you know, there's people, and he was right, you know, because as soon as I moved to New York, I, the first night that I got there, Sonny Murray, which is a friend of mine also from Philly who plays drums, and he was working with Albert Iowa at the time, I sat in and played with Abba Ala the night that I came there, like right away. And and then two weeks later, I got a job with Don Cherry and Farrell Saunders had just 
moved to New York about the same week I did. And we both got a gig with Don Cherry, which lasted for about four or five months at this club, at this little coffee shop, shop over on Sullivan Street in New York. So I immediately started working when I got to New York and, and with Archie Shep and all these guys who were thinking more like I was thinking. And uh, so, you know, it, it worked out really good, you know, for me. I mean, as soon as I got here, I got real busy. That's neat. Yeah. Henry, if, mm -hmm. I, if my, my figures are right, it looked like your first recording date was um, around 1957. Does that sound right? Uh, Pretty close, Lee yeah, Conitz, but uh, perhaps, or generally in that area, yeah. 58, 57, uh, maybe uh, 56 uh, before I left okay. Philadelphia, Before maybe. he goes with Shafi Hadi. Was what? Shafi Hadi. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right, I have that in. What was, were you nervous on your first recording date? Uh, I mean, I would be. I'm trying to think of who you're referring to was on that uh, first date. Uh, uh, my first recording, because uh, I had I had first gigs. Did I call it call uh, first gigs? Uh, playing yeah. with uh, Sha Shafi Hadid and groups like that. Pepper Adams, Wynton Kelly. Who was the leader in that? Uh, Shafi. I, I, it's not mm -hmm. a name I know. Shafi Hadi. Me either. Who was that? Shafi. Uh, uh, Curtis Porter. Trying to say. Oh, Curtis Porter. That's yeah, who that was. Curtis okay. Porter, yeah. See, because Henry was a little okay. more advanced than I was. Uh -huh. Henry started playing with the big timers before I even thought about leaving out of Philadelphia. He did it really fast, and man, his cat was, <laughs> he was something else. Jumped right into it, huh? Yeah, he did, man. He was playing with the big timers, right. man, before I even thought about getting out of Philly. Well, what was the recording dates like at that time? You showed up, did you rehearse for them, and how long would you usually get in a, a record date? Mm. I don't know. Uh, I know I did some record dates, but uh, uh, certain things I, I haven't reckoned with yet. That mm -hmm. uh, I don't know exactly mm -hmm. what happened with the, with those groups. But uh, were you talking about? Are you talking about uh, rhythm and blues groups? No, no. I'm talking about or? early on when you got into the jazz thing. It looks like you started recording like uh, pretty actively about once yeah, a month around um, 1957. Yeah, I think uh, 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 Lee Konitz, I did some recording with him, mm -hmm. the first, my first. Uh, but the rest of them, uh, you know, it's, uh, where they weren't re recording dates. Yeah. That was, uh, I was just, you know, playing with them. That was uh, like Jerry Mulligan and uh, Lee Konitz and uh, Dave Bailey, a drummer from, yeah, no, yeah. you know, them. Yeah, right. And. Uh, a lot of them, you know, uh, just about all of them in that circle. Was it was it uh, different to play in with Jerry Mulligan? He had no piano. And did that was change your playing? Uh, no, that made me rare. Want to you know want to do more? You know, mm -hmm. it was. Uh, but it was a lot of uh, at the time. It was a lot of uh, uh, no piano. Playing, you know, that I was doing, but but uh, I also did. Um, uh, well, I did a lot of uh, um, other groups, like he said, Shafi Hadi. Like he said, Shafi Hadi he was he was one of a yeah. side man, you know, the same as I, you know, right. I, I was a side man. I, I wanted to back up just a little bit. You had you you said your. Your family was uh, was a Baptist. You said Holy Roller, I think. You yeah, right. Holy Roller. We say Holy Roller, so that's right. like Baptist. And and the music thing. in that church was probably pretty upbeat. Very upbeat. I mean, they used to like, they used to like go nuts in there. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, like you ever heard of a thing called the unknown tongue? Yes. Uh, they would get so religious and so carried away with the music until sometimes they would just faint fall out, and then they would go start babbling, little, little, little stuff that you didn't even know what they were, and sometimes they would have like a, a seizure, and foam be coming out of their mouth, and I mean, it was, it, that was very intense stuff, you know, yes. 
and, and even it didn't it didn't matter what the age were I mean it'd be from older people to little kids who would actually just you know just you know something like that happened to me when I was in when I was in in Italy one night Sonny Fortune and I was playing in Italy one night and uh, and at times we used to play, I mean, this is recent, maybe a couple years ago, three, four years ago. We used to play very intense stuff, like we would play a song really up-tempo, and we would play it for the whole set without stopping. We'd play for an hour, hour, 20 minutes, up-tempo, like impressions or something, for the whole set. We'd do it for the whole set, just two of us, saxophone and drums, right? And this woman was right in front of us and she stood up and fell straight back it was in the convulsions and stuff and that reminded me of what had happened in the church when I was coming up right she was just sitting there and then all of a sudden she just leaped up in the air and screamed and fell back and we didn't really stop but we was on our way to stopping you know and they took her out and laid her in, took her like into the restroom area, and she was laid down. And, and, and we kind of came to the end of the song. And I rushed back there to see what was with her. And I looked down at her, and she was just, she was kind of okay a little bit. She said, it was the music, the music is just like, it just, it just, I mean, she actually, did one of those seizure things, right? And uh, and I used to see that happen in 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 the church on Sundays. Not every Sunday, mm -hmm. but sometimes you get really intense, and the tambourines be gone, and the people be singing, and the music be happening, and somebody would just oh, you know. Mm. Uh, I've seen that a lot of times. They used to call it the unknown tongue. Okay. And did they have another term for it, like, you know, uh, Doris got the spirit or something? Did they, yeah, that's did what it was. I mean, you know, mean, but actually, it was like a seizure or something. Uh -huh. You know, it was just wow. caught up in whatever it was yeah. and just fell out. And not maybe not completely fall out, but just start babbling and 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 and, and not not only that, but they had on staff in a lot of those black churches. They had a little nurse's office on staff where they would actually come out and get people. They have their red, their white gowns on and stuff. They come out and get people and take them to where they can rest. You know, they had nurses there to take care of these people because they were just like in those Baptist churches. We used to call them holy rollies as kids, right? They would just, just, just go right out. The music and it's usually the music that gets them, and the, and the praying and the and this praying and the preacher would be, you know, repetitiously saying these things over and over and over again, and the music would be going on and the choir would be singing and all this would be going on and then somebody would just go, oh, <laughs> that was, was intense, unbelievable stuff. Does that mm. find? Did that stuff find its way into your? I think all of it had something yeah. to do with it, you know. I mean, my whole life had something to do with, yeah. with, with what I do for a living. But uh, that was some intense stuff, you know. And I, I, I actually saw that happen. And when it happened in Italy, I was like, "Wow, this oh, is full circle. This is for real. <laughs> this is really for real." Did your father? Um, what made him convert? Uh, and leave that faith for I, I don't faith. know what it was you know like Philadelphia is is you know that it's it's a very kind of a religious kind of place you know mm -hmm. like everybody's looking for something different to be you know I mean oh. you know they want to be the same as this guy they want to be different from that guy so maybe you know that's how it all went down but uh whatever it was he was it could have been the music too because uh he was definitely a, a, a person who listened to a lot of music. He used to, I mean, he used to buy all the records and stuff in the house. So he had that, those stuff. He wasn't a musician, but he just listened, you know. I, I, 
he brought in records from Bird and Billie Holiday and all that kind of stuff. Well, my mom was was the Billie Holiday person, but uh -huh. he he bring in Charlie Park and Dizzy Gillespie and people like that. Bud Powell. That's mm. just so interesting to me because it, mom and dad bringing home, you know, Charlie Parker and. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, music was played in my house all the time, except Sundays, because my grandmother didn't allow uh -huh. jazz to be played on Sundays in the house. You can play spiritual and gospel music, like uh -huh. Mahalia Jackson and Rosetta Thorpe and people like that, but yeah. you couldn't play no Charlie Parker. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not on Sundays. Not on Sundays. Yeah. Never on Sundays. Not on Sundays. Yeah. No, no. Henry, I wanted to ask you about something I read, and I first I thought it was like, this has to be a misprint or something, but <laughs> in 1960, you did uh, the Newport Jazz Festival? 1960, I think. And, well, 58. And you played with about four different bands then? Yeah. Five. Benny Goodman mm -hmm. and uh, Lee Konitz, mm -hmm. Thelonious Monk, mm -hmm. Sonny Rollins. Sonny Rollins. Mm -hmm. And uh, who else was in there? Somebody else was in there. Yeah, Tony Scott. Tony Scott. That's a heck of a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's I used to wonder about that myself. It's like I drag in luck, you know? Yeah. Which I wanted to do. I wanted to do some playing, and uh, there I was, you know, playing with guys that uh, I used to know on record, you know? Mm -hmm. it was just That was just a fantastic thing. Yeah. He was 22 years old. That is fantastic. And the and the Benny Goodman group was was that his band or was that sort of a that was a his formed band. band for that, that event? That, that was his band. He had a big band for the, the Newport Jazz Festival and okay. uh, and a small group for other things I that see. we would play. We yeah. play. He had a quart, uh, quintet or quintet maybe it was the septet, mm -hmm. but uh, somewhere in, halfway in between, small and large, you know. Was he a, was he uh, interesting to work for? I've heard a lot of stories about him. Who? Benny Goodman. Oh yeah, he's yeah he's very interesting to work with. Uh, very humorous guy. You know? Humorous? <laughs> yeah, I you mean, there's certain things he he he's, he'll say uh, that had to make you laugh, you know, because uh, for instance, he's uh, he, I think I'm bad about remembering days, uh, days, and you know remembering who was on him and uh, what you know what was who. He would say, uh, he was uh, just about, uh, that's what I, you know, he he just forget days and, and uh, you know, different occasions of knowing somebody and he called somebody by their name, totally not not who the person oh. is. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, you sort of go through those kind of humorous things, but uh, mm -hmm. playing wise, it was uh, very, you know, very good. Yeah. First time I'd uh, ever played in any uh, professional, you know, it has, uh, completely professional kind of a gear, you know. Wow. So I enjoyed I enjoyed playing with uh, with. And the thing with that. Monk became part of the film, didn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I I never saw it. You I, never I saw, saw it? a little bit of it one night on a <laughs> on a DVD, but uh, okay. other than that, I haven't. Yeah, heard. that's pretty neat that that was captured like that. Mm. I'm trying to get a sense of um, you. You had said that uh, you know Coltrane. Said the way the, you need to go where people are thinking like you and and Henry, you've said that you you guys are forward thinking. The the free jazz that was happening in the '60s in New York. Did it come together? I'm not even sure how to ask this question, but did you guys used to sit and talk about music and say? Well, if we played this way, this could happen, or, or did it mostly just happen on the bandstand? No, oh, we didn't. I didn't really. We didn't ever really talk about it. We just did it. You know, it was like, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, you know, and the guys that I was hanging out with, you know, we we didn't sit down and say that we're going to play in and we're going to play out or we're going to tie mm -hmm. and and play mm -hmm. without bars or we, you know, it was just something that we did, something that we heard, and something that we listened to. Yeah, you know that kind of thing. It happened spontaneously. You know, yeah, I think that uh, uh, 
Because we did a lot of things, but it was never talking and saying, uh, you know, that now, now let's play this. this okay. It wasn't planned. It wasn't planned. You know, uh, it was just something that we all wanted to do, man, because we all, we all knew what bebop was. You know, because we listened to it, and we listened to it forever. And uh, it's just evolution to change. You know, I mean, just the, 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 the days and the times that we live in was different from the way it was when Buried was living, or the way it was when, 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 when Satchmo was living. Or, mm -hmm. you know, it was a different time, you know. And uh, our music reflected what was happening at that time. You know, that's what I think. And, uh, and so it, w it was time to play something different because everybody was in a different frame of mind. Can you be specific about that? Well, oh, say, say Rosa Parks, you know, got on the bus one day and decided that she wasn't going to sit in the back of the bus because she was too tired, right? And uh, say, like a bunch of service guys was on a train, and we, and we was all from, we was all from New York and Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and we got on a train going down south to, to uh, join a, a unit in the south. And on our way down south, we get off at a train station, and we go. And we, and we get off because everybody wants something to eat, they're hungry, and they, and they walk to the door and they see a sign that says, colored that way, whites only. You see signs like that, you know? And, and uh, they just go inside where the white place was and start taking stuff off the shelves and invading stuff and, and everybody gets detained and get in trouble or whatever that kind of a thing was going on, right? So the music reflected that, you know, reflected the hard time that we, that's why, but maybe they would say that we were playing angry music or whatever they might say it was, but it really wasn't. It was just reflecting the time of day it was. And I think uh, we sort of outgrew the bebop era mm -hmm. and wanted to start to playing something different from what it was because we were different people. We were. We were not the same people as those people who lived in that bebop time. We lived in a different age. And uh, I think that's what, that's evolution. That's how things change. Everything changed over time. You know, people live differently. And the mu music reflects the way you live. That's what I think it was. So we just wanted to play something different because we was living in a different time. Mm. That's how I feel. Well said. Yeah. yeah. For for the bass player, you know, for for all of jazz history to that point, you you were supposed to be the provider of the harmony, you know, the the root, and keep things keep the form going that way. Did did that start to change for the bass that you could f be freer, causing more playing than uh, than it was doing being so. being done. I mean, causes causes more playing to be played than uh, by that by that means, you know. Uh, the ba you know, bass players like uh, Oscar Peter Pettiford and uh, Ray Brown and uh, mm -hmm. Percy Heath and bass players like that, you know, Israel Israel uh, Israel Crosby and so on. Uh, they're just very, you know, very very good bass players technically mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know if you wanted to get wise about anything about uh, playing you know sometimes you you want to say something or play something by one of these uh, musicians you know yeah oh like Percy Heath or Ray Brown or okay so, forth. so most of your people that you listen to um, you saw them in New York, your sort of people that you wanted to emulate or heard them on record, is that right? Yeah, I mean like a lot, a lot of the players that I listened to like Philly Joe Jones was my first love and 
and Max Roach and Art Blakely and Elvin Jones. Th you know, that changed my way of playing because I heard, I heard in, I heard in Philly Joe Jones the way he st stretched out phrases, you know, and he would just do it for a little while. Like he would stretch the phrase out just for maybe, maybe two or three bars. Then he would go back to the swing. And, and I was wondering, I would say, wow, one would happen if you just kept stretching it out. Just keep stretching out for a little before you go back to the swing. But keep in mind where the time is, where everything else is. But just keep, just, just keep, you know. And then I listened to Art Blakely and Max Roach, and I felt like they all, actually, they all were avant-garde drummers to me because they were all like, they were all playing a beat, but they were like just doing little things inside the beat that I really listened to. So I've worked on that. I worked on that and, and tried to just stretch it out and elongate it until I was sort of playing that way all throughout everything else. But at the same time, keeping time and keeping tempo and keeping changes running through my head but just elongating it, just letting it just all stretch out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how I sort of developed my style of playing. And then listening to people like Cecil Taylor and Henry play with all these people, listening like people like Cecil and Henry Grimes and all those guys who were stretching out that stuff, right? And Sonny Murray, another drummer who was doing that, and Melford Graves, Andrew Surreal. We was all trying to just play something different, you know, and and and, uh, and it all came together, uh, actually. So, I, I you know, that, that's how I felt about it, you know. Henry, did you ever get, in those days, playing with someone where you felt, wow, I'm in way over my head here. I don't, I don't know what to do with this musician. Several times, yeah. Yeah? Several times, but I played it. I played it as much. I couldn't stop, you know, because, uh, you don't want to be uh, representing that kind of a sound, you know, so mm -hmm. I'd, I'd sort of like hang in there for as much as I could do, you know, and uh, I didn't have, uh, I didn't have too much trouble, but uh, sometimes I, uh, that happened to me, you know, even though, you know, I had to work to mm -hmm. get myself out of it, you know, and keep playing, you know, and, and that, that way, but uh, it was, that was still great. Uh -huh. Of all the the guys uh, that you've worked with, this this could be for both of you. Is there someone who was the best at giving you suggestions or directions that helped you? Can you? Is there a person that comes to mind? That Coltrane you, for me. Coltrane for you. He was my guru, man. He uh -huh. was my everything. I just he did. As far as I'm concerned, he did it all. And I was very fortunate that he took a lack into me and brought me in and um, sort of directed, well, not directed, but sort of gave me the, the privilege to explore my playing. He helped me to develop what I was trying to do. Because he, he saw what I was trying to do. And he just put me in a position to develop it. Mm -hmm. And he said that, and he's told me that, he, because Miles Davis did the same thing for him. He saw, he saw the potential in Coltrane, and he put him in a position when he can develop that stuff that he was doing. And that thing, same thing happened for me, you know. John brought me in there knowing that I had something and just gave me a chance to do it. And he would always say, all you need to do, and I always tell young musicians, ones that I like a lot, all you need to do is to keep playing. Just get with somebody that, can, that you can play and it'll come to you. I don't care what it is that you're playing, as long as you're playing and searching and trying to do this, it'll happen for you. So uh, I think, uh, he made it happen for me, or he gave me a chance to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Was there other things besides the, just the, the music that you gained from him also? Yeah, I gained how to be a, a better person. I know I gained how to, because I, I had a, 
I had a pretty, I had an ego. I was completely egotistical when I was coming up. I, I felt like, you know, I was, I was playing with Coltrane and I was the best that ever lived. You know, I was the only thing that ever happened on this earth, you know, because I was working with the greatest saxophonist in the world and I felt like I was all that, you know. And I used to, there's a story I, I used to, I used to tell, I told Trey once he asked me about this musician, you know, he said, you know, Rashid, he said, there's a musician out there asking me to set in, you know, and uh, he said, and he also said that he had played with you before. And he said, uh, what do you think, you know, what do you think, you know? He always used to come at me with stuff like that, you know, what do you think, should I let him play or something? And I said, oh man, that cat can't play shit, you know? And he said, oh, really? I said, man, he ain't playing shit, man. You know what he did? When we went out on the bandstand, the first thing he did was say, hey, man, come on up and play. And I felt like I wanted to disappear behind the drum set, you know? I felt so bad because I put the cat down without even thinking, you know, about anything. And uh, I was very quiet for the rest of the night. I wasn't saying anything to nobody. And he said, you know, that, you know, I'm not going to mention his name. He's not here anymore anyways. He said, you know, he say, you know, he say, what do you think about this guy, you know, that was playing, you know? Of course I wasn't going to say anything else bad about him. I said, well, you know. He said, well, you know, Rashid, he said, I'm going to tell you, man. He said, I don't care how bad or how good you think a person is playing music. I said, if he's playing music, he said, there's always something that you can get out of it if you listen. It might not be something you can use, but it, can, it might be something that you can use. I mean, I don't care how bad you think he plays or whatever, but there could be something there that you can get from it if you listen. And I never, I never, I never went at a, at a person like that again. You know, I never talked bad about a person since then because, you know, so, I mean, I learned a lot of stuff from John, you know, as to how to be as a person, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, and give people a break, man. Don't, don't talk down on musicians, especially if it's about music. So I, I, learned, I learned quite a bit from him as a, as a youngster coming up. In, in. And that works for me, too, because uh, I have a lot of respect for everybody. And, uh, and, I, and you learn a lot when you respect people because you're not closed-minded, you know? You don't think like, you know, because I feel like when you're closed-minded and can't and think you're all that, that's when I think you stop learning. Yeah. You, can't, you can't learn anything no more because you think you know everything. Yeah. And then you start going that way instead of this way. As mm -hmm. long as you keep your mind open like John and Cecil Taylor and all those cats, they keep their mind open. They, they, they embrace what people are doing and they listen. And that's how you become a great whatever you are trying to be behind just listening to people and being able to absorb stuff. Wow. And I learned that. Good lesson. Yeah. yeah. Henry, was there somebody in your past that, that you really felt that set you on a Helped, helped you on your musical career and your, your path that you were trying to take? Uh, yes, a lot of uh, uh, professionally, professional musicians like Ro Max Roach uh, are, uh, um, you know, uh, Prez, uh, and, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of musicians like that I, I play with. and. Uh, you know, I have to go through my struggle up there, which they, you know, encouraged me about doing. I always, I always felt like the bass player had a lot of responsibility, because first, I mean, if if you don't know the the tune, true, who's yeah. going to hear it? Who, you know, a saxophone player can sort of negotiate things by by listening to the bass player, but who's the bass player listening to? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the bass player is listening to everybody, including the drummer and, uh -huh. uh, you know, everybody, you know, everybody else. Uh, yeah. 
as far as playing, you know, playing something is. That, uh, uh, for instance, like uh, lately, I, I've been listening to uh, bass players that uh, uh, that don't they 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 stop uh, uh, playing what what they what what they think uh, uh, musicians hear when uh, somebody you know when you play uh, like. Um, I mean, it's just like uh, they have any music at all, you know, any 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 sheet music or mm -hmm. anything that has notes on it, and nothing that, uh, and it might be just something that you never heard of, you know, just like he said, he told him to come up there and uh, get understand and play, you know, a lot of those things uh, are part of the challenge, you know, yeah. they might come to you anyway. When you guys work together. Um, or this may happen in other combinations. I know you work with a lot of different people. If if something, if you're playing a song that is not preconceived, are there times when when you're playing together where you feel like we're sort of just marking time here, waiting for some thing to gel? <laughs> yeah, it's it's true, but I think it's more of a guess than an ac accurate knowledge of you know what's going to be ha coming coming okay. next, you know. But that's a thought because when the, a lot of the a uh, lot of the rhetorics, you know, and the pragmatics that that are, that are a lot of guys playing and uh, you know coming to a certain meaning and in, in their playing and in others, you know, and it's all happening at once, mm -hmm. you know. It, that that uh, uh, may not necessarily mean as a sign of times to come, something that is, yeah. you know, that kind of a sign. You know, not really. That's that's not really that way. It's uh, Rashid. How do you know when? It, like if I look on your your CD here, and there's a song that's twenty some minutes long. Is there something inside you guys that tells you? This one's over now. Well, we work on we we work on on, on each other's. Uh, oh, well, we work with each other on on things, and and we listen to each other, and we kind of work off of each other. You know, we sort of just bounce off of each other. You know, uh, like Kenny would get into an idea of something and. And I would catch up to it sometimes, or sometimes I can't, or um, maybe I, I'd be struggling trying to deal with it, but not struggling to the point where you can notice it at all, just within myself. Mm. And, yep. uh, and, uh, and then I say, oh, there's, here's where it's at, you know? And, and I would get there, and I would get there, and when I get there sometimes, Henry would be going someplace else, right? And now I'm after it again, you know? Uh, I mean, it's, it's just that it's like we're playing tag, you know? Uh. You know, I, I catch up and then it's like, wow, then I'm looking again and I catch up and then we come together on stuff and then we be apart and then, then we're together, then I'm after him and then he's after me and it, it gets like that. So it's, it's very exciting, you know? Yeah. I mean. Uh, for the listener, but sometimes I'll be hurting up there. But at the same time, you know, it's a good hurt. You know, it's something that is challenging, I would say. It's very challenging. Uh -huh. Yeah. Is there one of your hands or feet or one of your instruments that you find when, when you're not really comfortable and you're, you're, as you said, you're trying to find out where is it, whatever it is, do you find that you rely on something just to play more until you can really find oh, it? Oh yeah, well you know we have, we, uh, I definitely have a, uh, uh, something that I can fall back on, you know, I mean I have something that, I mean that's my experience and my proudness and my you know, and my experience that I pull on everything mm -hmm. when I'm playing just with Henry because 
uh, I'm dealing with just the bass, you know. I'm not dealing with horns and piano and all that, you know. So I, I have to rely on my on my ex on my experience and proudness and and so a, a lot of times I could get something I can pull up on something that would get me through the mass, you know, it get me through like the uneasiness until I can catch up to what's happening. Uh, I don't stop. I just keep going until it comes into view mm -hmm. and then I'm okay again. Yeah, and, and that lasts until it changes again. So, because it's, it's always different, it's always changing. Yeah. And you know, then you know, we keep up some stuff for maybe 20 minutes or 25 minutes, you know. And then after a while, you know, we we'll sort of look at each other and go like, okay, this is it's time to it's time to leave this now. Yeah. And bang, we quit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Me. Henry, you, the 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 years you spent out of the music business, were mm -hmm. were you still were you listening to music? Did you have an uh, opportunity to listen to the what was going on? I wasn't. No. I, okay. I was. I, I was uh, I was listening to uh, Mexican, uh, the Texas Mexican music. Oh. Or and I, or I've been listening to a lot. I was listening to a lot of uh, what's the name of that other kind of Mexican music? Where seven different kinds of music uh, that they play. Uh, mariachi. Yeah, mariachi uh -huh. and uh, a lot of Chinese and other things like that. Uh, all kinds of things like that. All all different kinds of. Of them, my favorite was the Texas, uh, Texas, uh, Mex, Tex Mex, Tex Mex music, music. Yeah, oh, you know, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I used to listen to that. But uh, uh, I, I didn't have all I had was a TV, and uh, mm -hmm. sometimes I catch some things uh, on TV, maybe slightly, but right, very, very slightly resembling the thing okay. I had on my mind. Were you surprised uh, at the change in technology when you went, eventually went back into uh, into the studio to record, and what had happened with how things are done? No, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not aware of it. Really. Okay, it's just like a lot of uh, technology has occurred between then and now, you know, and also uh, well. F for many years, it's always been a thing of technology and, and sound, uh, sounds and uh, uh, electronics, you know, mm -hmm. being hooked up with music. The years that, that you weren't playing, is that when your poetry really became uh, a vital part of what you were doing? On a uh, uh, yeah, when I, when I had nothing to, to do, like, uh, with that, I'd, I'd write poetry, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's uh, you know sometimes my, I might be thinking about how do I favor a beat, and I or something like that. But uh, uh, that's that was just uh, you know just just an idea to uh, mm -hmm. make uh, rhythmic, but also uh, all kinds of metric ideas, you know. Uh, poetry or music. Okay. But uh, I, I wasn't just doing music at doing that time. So that's, uh, that, was, that was a long time ago. That was about 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, you made a big impression when you came back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. You yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> I, I look at your upcoming calendar. It looks pretty healthy to me. Yeah. Th there's, no, there's words that I've noticed uh, from both of you on your CDs and in your poetry book that seem to to occur uh, pretty often. Um, uh, f forces, aggregate, and things about rituals. And um, I love this word, external myst mysticism. East, yeah. What, uh, what are the rituals that you are referring to? You have to ask Henry about okay. that. Because that's rituals? his words. Yeah. Uh, going east, you know, it's just like it's eternal when you go east. Yeah. You know, like that. Uh, the sun rises in the east, or okay. 
you know, what uh, uh, impulses derive their existence from coming from the East and the, or like that, you know. Um, uh, you know, you know, and I, and because I was writing that, you know, I had something to do with instead of watching TV, you know, after after work. But I'd do that. I'd write after work, you know, essentially, you know, that's what mm -hmm. it means. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm glad s as somebody heard my has heard my poetry this time. You know, I didn't expect that to happen. You know, mm -hmm. but yeah, but it did. You know. Isn't that interesting? I hear you've got quite a collection too. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. yeah, I have to do something about the. However, you do that, you know. But I'm I'm open for any right. suggestions. Right. I think it was also a reference to coming back to New York from California. From okay. She was predicting to herself and preparing himself for coming back you know, from the West Coast to the East Coast. Happen. Yeah, that yeah. yeah that that also because. Uh, that gives you know that gives you the opportunity to come from some source in uh, understanding, mm -hmm. you know. That's a that's a whole source that there you know whether if you're going to cut, return to music or return from music, mm. you know it's a lot of uh, knowledge in there. I mean a lot of understanding and a lot of uh, uh, you know it's no no nothing nothing is uh, just uh, something you can really take for granted, but. You know, it's there. You know, all those things can come together and make a metaphor. You know, become metaphor. Oh, okay. I mean, it can, uh, uh, but you might do something else. You know, I'm not saying do that. You know, you might it might be something else that you. You know, you were talking the other day about, uh, I guess yesterday, about the uh, effort that you made, both of you, back in the it, uh, number of years ago, to get free or avant-garde jazz on some of these festivals, that they weren't presenting that spectrum of the music. And in the last year or so, I went to a big jazz convention, and the, the people that promote Dixieland music were, you know, very early, were complaining about the same thing. And it's like mm. they're leaving out the, the ends of the music. Do you agree with that? And how to? And can you tell me about the? the well, things back in uh, like in the seventies, like the early part of the seventies, um, I don't know too much about the Dixieland, but probably they are leaving out Dixieland and avant garde uh, now. But not now, n not so much now because uh, the avant garde is really popular in Europe. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you know, we get like huge crowds in Europe with this stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, it's uh, festivals. You know, attracts a lot of people from all every all around. And but actually, it really got a hold there more or less more so than here. Uh, in fact, most of the European players that plays jazz are. Or into avant-garde more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Some of the fusion stuff works too a little bit, you know, like the cap from the bitches boo era and stuff. But oh. a lot of the 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 music is very avant-garde there in Europe, and 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 so like uh, here in in America, it's alive, but not well. You know, it's alive here. Uh, you can find this stuff in just about every major city. You know, you find a place that that caters to this kind of music j in just about every major city, like mm -hmm. uh, one club maybe or something. But uh, and and then even some of the main jazz clubs would hire like the really name avant-garde players like Cecil Taylor or Ornette Coleman. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they even get a shot at it too. Yeah. Because I'm sort of like an old timer now, <laughs> and uh, and so we 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 get to play in a lot of the major clubs here now, but in the '70s, it wasn't about to be had. You know, uh, uh, we we were hurting for places to play. We were hurting for recording companies to record us, so we were forced to to start our own kind of venues. We went into like 
like into loft situations in New York City and and people started fixing up lofts and putting on their own concerts and putting on their own things. They call it loft jazz or yeah. loft times and then we started us, uh, you know, uh, putting out our own records, actually the whole deal, like recording them, pressing them up, and selling them on our own, or either taking them to distributors and, and get a deal with the distributors to put them out and to get them around to record stores and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, you know. So actually we were well, like self-made in the 70s because we wasn't getting any help from from the major companies or the major clubs, you know? And, uh, but uh, we survived. We survived, we, st we, st we got people to come out to listen to us, we sold our records, and, 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 and then we, I mean, we did so well, and we even had our own jazz festival called the New York the New York Jazz Musicians Festival, which, which was a, a festival that sort of uh, bumped head with George Ween's mm -hmm. mm. uh, Newport S Festival, because No Avant Garde Festival was on that, mm. and it, and we and we sort of put a dent in their thing. We got a lot of people that was coming from Europe, and they was coming to hear us. More, more than going down to Carnegie Hall and listening to, See. and listening to, uh, you know, what George Ween had, and so George Ween made a deal with us actually to make us a part of his festival, which was unheard of, oh. and uh, so we did that. I mean, you know, the, 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 I mean, that's a long story. I didn't get involved in it because I felt like a lot of things wasn't being done that should have been done. Mm -hmm. But some of us went and they, George Ween got him a, a place and advertised it on his, on his Newport stuff and, and got the avant-garde people a, a venue, a couple venues for them to play on his festival as well. And then a lot of the clubs started giving us jobs because we had our own places anyways the play, so they just got in on the act. And, and, and so actually, man, we were kind of self-made. We sort of forced, forced them to uh, recognize who we were and what we were doing and giving us employment and giving us gigs and giving us record dates, didn't like, you know. Was that something with the, the October Revolution? That was one of the beginnings of it. Yeah, okay. That was one of the beginnings of it, you know, like Cecil Taylor and and Bill Dixon, and because I was playing with Bill, Bill Dixon at that time, and uh, Cecil Taylor, Bill Dixon, and uh, Carla Blay, and Paul Blay, and different people like that, they started that, that October Revolution. Actually, Bill Dixon was one of the main things in that. And then they got the JOC uh, thing, too. Uh, which started a record distributing company. And so that encouraged people to make their own records and, and JVC, what, uh, uh, not JVC, uh, Jazz JCOA, Jazz, Jazz Composers, Composers Orchestra Guild. Orchestra. Guild. Right, okay. and, and they got a distributing thing going on and they would distribute our records if we made them and get them to them. Mm -hmm. and it was LPs at that time and they right. would distribute them for us and and, and they had a pretty good wide range of distributing and they would get them all over America to different record companies and and so we sort of got a little bit of play behind that and and got a little independent too as well and uh, so we were sort of we sort of got jobs you know we, they started reaching out and getting us on these some of these jobs I think that's really how it got started because we we was sort of like uh, we saw it was like competition, especially in New York City. You know, I figure if you come to New York, then you have to deal with the jazz musicians festival yeah. and have to deal with the avant-garde jazz musicians, and and that sort of helped helped the situation out a bit. I see. How are we doing for time, Mary? Eight, Eight minutes. Oh. Uh -huh. 
You know, it's, it feels really good to be able to say uh, President Obama these days. Yeah. About eight days he's been, and eight or nine days. I wonder how you guys have any personal And it feels even better him. when President Obama says he likes John Coltrane. You know, that's even feel better because he said in one of his speeches that he gave his brother-in-law a love supreme because he was playing with, he was playing with, he was, say so he was playing a lot of music, man. He said, he said, man, I really want you to hear something. He's trying to get his musicianship, his music together. He said, I want you to really hear something really great. So he said, I gave him John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. So right, right, right there, when Obama said that, I go like, wow, this cat is into the music. So it's right possible he could have interstellar space there in his house or something, you know, because uh, he openly spoke of John Coltrane, and I never, ever heard a president speak of John Coltrane, you know? So uh, that, that also, well, I went, oh, wow, man, we really got somebody in the White House is really possible. Well, Cecil Taylor played in the White House. I don't know, I think it was under Bill Clinton because he had a saxophone, yeah. you know, Bill Clinton had a saxophone. In fact, I got his CD, the Bill Clinton CD, when he played saxophone. I didn't know such a thing existed. Yeah, it did, and I bought it right away, and I never played it. I, be, I think I played it once, but I just kept it for archives, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and so, like, Obama's talking about Coltrane, you know, so, like, it could be possible one day to play at the White House. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> at the White House. Yeah, because he's definitely, he definitely said that he was giving his, his brother-in-law a, a love supreme. He said that, it, it, you know, I went like, wow. So, uh, so Obama is uh, really, he's really the cat, man. He's, he's, he's trying to do it all. Yeah, very hopeful. Very hopeful, yeah. yeah. Henry, I see you're doing something coming up at Berkeley. Yes. Yeah, and the New England Conservatory. Man, you guys, uh, I, I just love to see the arc of, the, of a career, you know, like that. And, uh, that that's really great. Thank you. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's really great that they're doing something in Hamilton College. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to hearing you guys perform tomorrow night. I'm going to be fascinated to... Uh, um, I, I think if there's a type of jazz that I really need to, mo to know more about personally, I think it's what you guys do. So I'm going to be watching and listening very intently to, uh, I'm trying to figure out the, the level of uh, spontaneity and structure and, and all that and how that works. So. Well, if we keep in mind that it's bass and drums, uh, that would that get you over the first, that would get you over the hump, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Keeping that in mind because it's a lot different from a full quartet or quintet right. or, or you know, whatever. I mean, or even a duo with drums and saxophone or a duo with bass and saxophone or, you know, this is two rhythm instruments playing together. And, uh, and of course, Henry has taken over the melodic structures mm -hmm. as well as playing rhythmically. And, uh, and I'm doing the best I can with melodic, with melodic stuff yeah, as a drummer. About that. Yeah, I'm like doing that. as best I can with that melodic stuff being a drummer, but I'm a very, I hear melodically, so I, I, I approach the drums in a very different way than right. most drummers. Well. It's been fascinating meeting you guys and getting to know you, and I look forward to the concert. And Great. I want to thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us up here. It was really good. Okay. Yeah.